Yep, the mic's working now. Oh, here's a wick dipper. Oh, hello, wick dippers, uh, chip dippers. Welcome to Retro Recipes. Now, last week when we had that electro boom moment, I don't know how I didn't notice, Puppy Fracto did try to tell me that that power supply was made by Skynet. Yeah, that explains everything. Well, this week we're going from one type of zap to another. And we're going to be talking about the magazine Zap 64. Now, it really was a cultural phenomenon when I was growing up in England, although not so much in other countries. But um, <laughs> before Puppy Fractic goes to sleep, I think it's fair to say that one of the reasons, well, three of the reasons were the zany characters that they had reviewing stuff with those wacky haircuts. And also just the fact that it had that incredible Oliver Frey artwork that was the very amusing uh, cartoony drawings on the edges of the page, featuring Rockford, of course. You want to eat Rockford? It was such a cultural phenomenon that the building that they produced it in now features a blue plaque on the wall. Which means in blue plaque terms, it's on par with Charles Dickens. For our American viewers, Charles Dickens was a writer. We know who Charles Dickens is. Uh, anyway, I think it's fair to say that my own zany sense of humor, well, I largely have Zap64 to thank and you have them to blame. There is no doubt in my mind that my comedy <laughs> was largely influenced by reading Zap64 every month. Case in point, when I was a kiddie wink back in 1985, me and a bunch of friends made this. This is Splash and Crack magazine, named after Crash and Zap, Crash being the ZX Spectrum version of Zap64. Now, we weren't really trying to compete with Zap64 or Crash. Uh, we sold this for charity outside Kew Gardens in West London. But it does go to show you just how much of an influence this was on the playground mentality of the time. I certainly had a lot of mentality going on. Yeah, I like that one too. Uh, well, coming up, we'll take a deep dive into Splash and Crack and Crash and Zap. Welcome to Retro Recipes. Oh, you'll get one when you're older. Welcome. Before we begin, huge thanks to everyone from Zap64 who helped me put this together, as well as Anthony and Nicola Caulfield, the Bedrooms to Billions team, for sharing the fascinating upcoming interview footage with us. And not least, Oliver Frey, who has contributed brand new Rockford artwork for this little video. Yep, Rockford's still around today, 30 years on. Doesn't he look great for his age? <laughs> uh, it, it's perifractic. <sighs> okay, you're forgiven. Computer magazines in 1983 were jargon-filled with an emphasis on serious software, which was a bit of a turn-off to Commodore 64 owners. We just wanted to have fun. Down to number two, Underworld from Ultimate. Britain's number one. And I know the same was true outside the UK as well. We'll be exploring that in just a few moments for any of my lovely non-UK viewers. So was this a great niche and opportunity for an interesting gaming focused C64 magazine filled with energy and irreverent humor to hit the market? Well, as Zap's 100th issue would much later put it, you bet your shoes it was. In 1983, so quite recently then, three nice chaps by the names of Roger Keane, Oliver Frey and Franco Frey started a new endeavor, a small mail order gaming catalog, which they called Crash Micro Games Action. As Roger explained to Nicola and Anthony Caulfield back in 2011, Oliver's brother Franco had been sourcing Spectrum games for a German because they couldn't get them over there. And we realized you couldn't really find them in the shops over here either. And we were contacted by a magazine distributor Wells Gardner Darton, who'd actually shown a copy of one of our primitive catalogues to a buyer at Smith's. 
and W.H. Smith said this, if there was a magazine like that, they would probably buy it. And he said to us, so if you want to go ahead, you've earned the right to lose a lot of money. And so their publishing company, Newsfield, was born here at number two King Street in Ludlow, just across the street from W.H. Smith. And this, of course, gave us Crash magazine, dedicated to the ZX Spectrum. And that's where the team came up with a groundbreaking idea. Rather than use journalists or stuffy experts to review games, they used school children. After all, they were the ones buying the games, or, or their parents were, so why shouldn't the kids be the ones reviewing the same games? But this posed the big problem for the software developers. Kids were honest. There was no way of buying off teenagers because they had no commercial sense. A lot of people said, oh, wasn't there the opportunity that they could have been bribed off, etc. No, they were not commercially minded. And they turn around and say, you can't give it that score. And turn around and say, yeah, we can. If the target market was going to be 14-year-old boys, mainly, then it should be 14-year-old boys that did the reviewing. So Ludlow School got a huge lift and a pool of, I don't know, 20, maybe even 30, 13 to 16-year-olds used to pile in after school and we gave them forms which they filled out um, and we took it from there. So that was the start of Newsfield and Crash, but I didn't own a Specky, although my best friend growing up, Matty Fractic, did. And so I got a glimpse into the world of the first Newsfield magazine at a point when Crash itself was flying high with over 100,000 copies sold per month. But with healthy rivalry growing between the two machines, C64 owners like me, well, we wanted our own version of Crash. And seeing the growing market, the team started to plan just that. Initially, their mag was to be called Sprite and Sound. Pretty clever. Until a last minute change of heart gave us Zap 64, with its first issue being released on the 11th of April, 1985, when I was just 12. I think it was a dream come true for many 13 to 16 year old boys. A number of those who were um, better qualified at their English, um, left school and joined the Newsfield organisation as it grew. But although Newsfield's offices were in Ludlow, the Zap64 editorial team started their work in Yeovil in Somerset, a factor that would later cause some drama. We'll come to that in a moment. And they were a young bunch as well. It must have been quite a strange place to work, right? Any company that has so many young people working for it can't help but be exciting. I mean. They were a madcap lot, some of them anyway, so <laughs> boredom didn't come into it. <laughs> Case in point, see this coat hanger? It served a specific and important purpose, for one reviewer to hit the other on the head to get their attention because they were wearing Walkman headphones. And knowing that kind of thing about the Zap office really encapsulates the spirit and energy that was captured on the pages. Now, there were some other members of the editorial team that helped kick off that first issue. There's Chris Anderson, who was the editor, and he gained his experience as editor of Personal Computer Games magazine, PCG. Here he is at the Zap launch party, cutting the Zap cake. If his name sounds familiar, it's probably because he went on to found the legendary competitor to Newsfield, Future Publishing, as well as the website IGN and a little something called the TED conference. Then there was Bob Wade, a software editor and another risk taker from PCG that brought his wisdom on board. Helping them out was Steve Cook, a freelance writer who also happened to be a past content contributor to, yep, you guessed it, Personal Computer Games magazine. Well, you can see there's a bit of a trend here. But when Rockford asks, who's the white wizard? Well, it was Steve. But perhaps most memorable to readers were the reviewers Gary Penn and Julian Rignall, aka Jazz Rignall. But did you know they actually earned their place in the magazine by winning video game tournaments? Fight the monsters, solve the puzzles, beat the big baddie. So a win-win situation there. The 1983 Computer and Video Game Arcade Championships, which I went on to win, bring me to the attention of Chris Anderson. A few months later, he, he called me up out of the blue 
asking me if I was interested in interviewing for a new magazine that he was in the process of starting up. Uh, eventually managed to get the job, which turned out to be at Zap64 magazine. He kind of took a leap of faith with, you know, I'm going to show these slightly older guys that are hard, hard, hardcore gamers. And quite a handful in the early days. I mean, I was a nightmare. So was Gary, with throwing chairs around the office and punching walls and swearing. We barely knew we were in a professional environment, but what we did know is we knew how to play games and, you know, we had opinions and big egos and we would write these reviews. And this naturally followed on from what had made Crash Reviews so honest. The reviewers were selected by their gaming experience and not necessarily by their literary skills, although they had those too. And so the honesty remained. And as part of their reviewing system, three reviewers were required to thoroughly play each game through to completion. This really helped earn Zap the trust factor from subscribers. I didn't have that much control over it because if I said to somebody, I'll give them a good review because they're nice guys, um, <laughs> it just told me to bugger off, you know. You couldn't get away with that. Brilliant. You know, it's a cliche now, but it wasn't so much then. Uh, you know, by gamers for gamers. The fact that, that we had three different reviewers look at a game, so you'd have that different contrasting opinions. You know, you could read a review of something that maybe did do particularly well, but a reviewer that you might like, that you know that you like the same games as them. And that, that might be enough to make you want to buy the game. You know, we'd get a bad game and we'd just kick it to death. We'd absolutely kick it to death. And it was, you know, it was horrible for the person reading it, but, you know, great for the readers. And there was just something about those reviewers that, well, it helped Zap64 quickly become favoured over its sister magazine, Crash, not to mention its competitors. For me, the reason uh, Zap above Crash worked was that, that cult of personalities. Now, of course, it wasn't all plain sailing, and we'll get back to the interesting twists and turns that followed in just a minute. But it's worth mentioning that, rather cleverly, that although Crash and Zap would later go on to share an office, they positioned themselves as rival magazines, and the editors were encouraged to ramp up their antagonism. This actually further fueled the rivalry between the Commodore 64 and the Spectrum, but also, well, it buoyed the industry and the magazines along. And that's where Splash and Crack was born, as two rival playground magazines within one binding, kind of like two sparring siblings living in one house. Me and a few friends put this together every week, I don't know, month? Yep, this is the celebrating the 10th issue! And I would stand outside Kew Gardens in West London with my friend Matty Fractic, and we would sell these for, well, 5GP. Yeah. However, we gave all proceeds to charity. Everything went to save the children. Because although we were children, we didn't need saving. I think we raised about £100, which is pretty good for a couple of 10 year olds. Fab. And I think we drew all of this on Mac Paint. It's fab because I say so. Now I'm showing you Splash and Crack to demonstrate just what a pop culture influence Zap was. But the more I researched things, the more I realized it wasn't just me paying homage to Crash and Zap. Here's a similar thing that Mark Howlett, otherwise known as Lord Arse on Twitter, was doing around the same time. So I guess this is just Splash, someone called C. Simpson, and J. Brett. Weird thing is, I have no idea <laughs> who that is. And I think I just made it up to seem like I hadn't done the whole thing myself. <laughs> but it wasn't just me making up names. When you look at the letters page, Zap Rap, you'll see that it was run by a Lloyd Mangrum, only he didn't exist. They made up this name to make the offices and the publications seem bigger than it really was. Actually, Lloyd's pieces were generally written by whoever the editor was at the time, although Roger Keane rather cheekily still denies Lloyd was fake. But Zap wasn't a high-tech publication. The issues were put together on boards like these, essentially using glue and tape. Kind of like how we put Splash and Crack together, actually. That's the Zilog Z80A. Well done, whoever did this. I remember being given, we, we had these like little word processor machines. It was actually quite advanced for the time. Little laptop computers with um, LCD displays that only displayed about four or five lines of text. 
but we could sit there and and write our reviews, which we would then upload to Chris Anderson's. I think he had an apricot computer. Where did that name come from? Well, famous golfer, of course, because. Well, I don't really know why, but when it came to fooling all of us, they certainly scored a hole in one. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, but as it happens, I had even more fun with some fake names. Oh, this is Ed's page. Oh dear, the Ed has me measles. <laughs> we thank you very much for your generous offer of 2p towards <laughs> Save the Child's Fun. <laughs> Yours, crappingly, <laughs> Johnny Ross. Johnny Ross, by the way, if you're an American, uh, Jonathan Ross is sort of a British Jimmy Fallon. This is a letter done by the secretary who cracked fired last, <laughs> last Monday. Well, speaking of America, all this zap stuff was going on in the UK. So what was the equivalent in the USA and other countries? Well, while making this documentary, I would go to sleep every night with my loved one. Pondering that very question. Oh, there's my loved one. I see you're reading the Zap calendar. Did you like Crash and Zap when you were growing up? Were we having a Crash and being Zap? No, the Crash and Zap, they're the computer magazines. That's what you're reading, the calendar. Oh, uh, no, but I did read the cult classic Splash and Crack, which they were never able to find who the author was. And I think with all the residuals, it made millions, millions. 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 Oh. Well, sadly, that was all just a dream. Yeah, she's still mad at me about that Charles Dickens thing. Well, someone called the 9-Bit Guy told me that they had a Hoy magazine and Computes Gazette. But everyone that I spoke to conceded that these didn't come close to what we had with Zap and Crash. In fact, some people exported Zap to other countries just to feel closer to the gaming community. I spoke to US journalist David Farquhar about this, and he said that basically US editors were just afraid of upsetting software companies, quite the opposite to Zap's approach. He said the most he ever got away with was calling Windows ME the backstreet boys of operating systems. <laughs> That's pretty edgy. But did you know there was even an Italian version of Zap? largely comprised of translated reviews. We'll get back to Zap in just a moment, and in a second, we'll see how it influenced playground mentality, including mine. Little bees calculating capers. Do the sum and see what source is on Chinese food. Interesting. Um, 782 minus 278. Hey, what's 782 minus 278? The answer is 514. Sai. Sai? Sai? <laughs> I can't do maths anymore. Hey, what's 782 minus 278? The answer is 504. Oh, 504. <laughs> Soy. Uh. By the way, I should mention our wonderful sponsor. We don't need to get letters or 20p purchases of Splash and Crack anymore, thanks to PCB Way. And I've recently been stocking up on my Vic 2 Squared, that's the PAL NTSC switcher board that I created along with one stage for the Commodore 64. And if you want to order one of those, check out the link in the description. Thanks to PCB Way for sending these PCBs so that I can keep boxing these up for you guys. Because as we all know, PCB Way stands for people could be waving at you, doesn't it? Now, it was around the time of issue four and that incredible Beachhead 2 cover that Zap64 and the team had to face their first hurdle. After some deliberation, the team decided to move the magazine offices into the Newsfield Limited headquarters back in Ludlow in order to cut some expenses. And the crash team kindly shifted over to make space for them. 
Unfortunately, two of the most important role players, Chris Anderson and Bob Wade, opted to stay behind and pursue other endeavours. The editor of Crash, Roger Keane, took on the responsibility as editor for Zap64. A new reviewer joined as well, and he was Paul Sumner, who also did not exist. The up Jazz and Gary collaborated to build this bogus persona in order to fill the void left by the others. This act went undetected. Paul Sumner, in fact, lasted until issue 34. And it was in issue 4 as well that Lloyd Mangrum made his first appearance, simply because Chris Anderson used to handle the letters, and now, well, there was nobody. But I mentioned that incredible Beachhead 2 cover, and it was around now that everyone was really starting to notice Oliver Frey's stunning artwork. And this was something I think we all felt reading the magazines, much in the same way that, you know, the box art of a game would give your imagination somewhere to go when playing the, well, naturally less impressive graphics of the actual Commodore 64 game itself. And something I realized more with passing years is that that teenage imagination was a real part of the foundation of what would become nostalgia for many of us today. So thank you for that, Ollie. Set our magazines apart was the extensive use of illustration. The computer game screens in themselves are rather dull. Illustrations were a way of bringing the subject matter to life and make it exciting for what are, after all, younger readers. When you look back at some of those early early ads, you know, you'd have like a little dude maybe crude drawing and then like literally three paragraphs of text. I'd been an illustrator by then for quite a while and mainly illustrations I did were per se aimed at the sort of teenage market. I was really producing high quality artwork that brought the games to life. You'd look at that and go, wow, that, that must be really cool and exciting. But as you noticed, Splash and Crack featured comic strips as well as some computer pages I'll show you in a second. Good morning, you have a rare oil type X, prick. Robbie is now giving some oil. Phew, at least I've got out of that place. Oh no, help, Robert smashed it up. You are okay now, but you lost a lot of oil and you have a very rare type X. I don't think we have any in reserve. I'll just have a look. Great, I've got news for you, Robert. I've got one can left. <laughs> Genius work there by Matty Fractic. But why did we have comic strips? Well, we were inspired by a certain comic strip in Zap 64, albeit a bit more serious in tone. Terminal Man was actually first conceived of by uh, Kelvin Gosnell, who was a 2000 AD writer. However, uh, Oliver had always been bugging me that we had to have a comic strip in it from when we were beginning the first plans for the magazine. Partly because it was aimed at boys of around 14, 15, and I wanted to draw a comic strip. Then it had to tie in somehow with computer games. He came up with this idea of a man who's so damaged in the space accident that half of him has to be rebuilt by computer imaging. So what about Rockford, that lovable character that seemed to be an uninvited insect who somehow crawled his way into the printing presses to add his own amusing comments to the proceedings? Well, he was actually originated for the Boulder Dash games and then used by Zap64 with permission, or in fact encouragement, by the game's developers. And in Splash and Crack, he of course inspired us to create Dubri. I loved reading the Rockford parts of Zap, I just couldn't resist paying homage with my own interpretation. It was almost that one issue of Zap a month just wasn't enough for us, so we made our own version. Hi fans, just look at the that Nightlaw offer, isn't it great? What, <laughs> what fans? It was a great marketing tie-in, and the use of Thing from Thing on the Spring followed. Well, by the end of 1985 and issue 7, more changes were afoot at Zap Towers. Gary Lydon and Sean Masterson joined the staff at Zap 64, and they were real people this time. But October 85 also saw the start of Newsfield's Amstrad magazine, Amtix. And who could forget that? Well, I could. I hadn't actually heard of it until this documentary, but I wish I had. Well, time is marching on as it was with Zap. By the summer of 1986, with issue 13, they'd hit a record-breaking figure. They were the first magazine to sell over 40,000 copies a month 
within the first year of launch. Now that happy moment wasn't to last, but we'll let Zap enjoy that high just for a moment while we take a quick look back at Splash and Crack because we did cover a lot of computer stuff. For example, here is a tips page and you can see some cheats that you can try on the game Elite, which funnily enough was one of the highest rated games to appear in Zap. We've also got this, form a coded message. I guess if you want to hit pause and try and type that in, feel free, let us know in the comments what it does. Probably forms a coded message. And just in case you are liking what you're seeing with Splash and Crack, I'm going to do a full walkthrough video and subject my patrons only to that. Bigfoot. Hope this trap works, then I can stop writing this silly cartoon. Uh, he went in and found himself in a computer game. He was in Way of the Exploding Fist. I am bored. <laughs> why, is he, why has he got one Bigfoot? Uh, I'll also make a PDF of a couple of issues worth of Splash and Crack available to patrons as well. Uh, apologies, patrons. <laughs> Wig. Why, why has he got a wig? He's, he's a caveman. Now, unfortunately, by the time issue 17 came along, the Zap team weren't having nearly as much fun as we were. Firstly, Roger Keane left his position as editor to take on managing Newsfield, with Gary Penn taking his place. Also, Richard Eddy replaced Gary Lydon. But in the face of adversity, the Zap team went back to doing what they did best, reviewing games. We rallied behind Zap by reviewing some games too. Our number one at the time was Paradroid. By the time issue 19 came out, they'd grown from 42,000 a month to nearly 55,000 issues sold every month in the UK alone. I don't think I realised that they were going to be quite so powerful as they turned out to be a few years later. It's no surprise then that when we chose our favourite computer mag, number one was Zap64. <laughs> and apparently my number seven favourite comic was Barbie. <sighs> By July 1987, with sales figures peaking 80,000 issues, Gary Penn said that he was just worn out and quit as editor. And for Zap, this was to be the start of a downward slope. For example, in an issue five months later, the first warning sign started to show when they incorporated a 16-bit section. It was understandable, they'd seen the slowdown in the 8-bit market and wanted to cater for Amiga and Atari ST fans. But Zap64 probably wasn't the right place to do it. Basically, in sort of 87, 88, companies began to, to make bets. Maybe the, the Amiga and the, the, the Atari ST were going to you know, be the new successors. People would upgrade their old 8-bit machines to these 16-bit machines. And it didn't really happen in the kind of... nowhere. It's certainly not in the numbers of the previous generation. Or as Jazz put it, writing at the time about that decision, so now there's a different idiot at the helm. But in a way, the problem was that they were advertising superior machines to Commodore 64 readers, their own customer base. Now, I can't remember fully if I read this and if it was the reason that I upgraded to the Amiga and stopped reading Zap, but it might well have been. And we didn't sort of take great care of what was happening in the marketplace. So when issue 40 rolled on, well, one of those founding reviewers, Julian Jazz Rignall, left his throne. That was a very difficult throne to fill. Julian Rignall was just a natural star. I mean, it's always the hair and, you know, the whole bit, and Gary Penn with the huge Mohican. And whenever they went to a trade show, there were just lines waiting for uh, autographs. Still, they tried to fill the hole, and the fictional Paul Sumner was brought back in for one last hurrah. But for me, as a reader, the new reviewers seemed like nice guys and everything, but, well, they just didn't have that celebrity status. And they had sensible haircuts. Oh, jeez. Get that off there. <clears throat> the penultimate nail in the coffin, though, was to be the decision to start publishing Amiga gaming content and change the magazine's title for the November 1988 issue. This was to prove a mistake from which Zap would never recover. What also didn't help is that, rather bizarrely, three reviewers were fired in June 1989 in the middle of producing the important 50th issue for reasons that still remain a mystery today. 
No, seriously, nobody wants to talk about it even 30 years on. But their reviews remained in the mag as if nothing had happened. And that final nail in the coffin? Well, sadly, issue 82 saw yet another change of editor to Lucy Hickman, who replaced that irreverent humour with smutty jokes, silly cartoons, and a certain Miss Whiplash replacing Lloyd Mangrum. I wonder if she's any good at golf. Unfortunately, this all led some parents to ban their kids from buying Zap altogether. And I can see why. To me, it looked more like Viz magazine than the Zap 64 that I used to love. And even the final editor, Steve Shields, couldn't whip the mag back into its glory days. In autumn of 1991, Newsfield filed for bankruptcy. And for the first time, Zap failed to hit the shelves. Newsfield attempted on several occasions to expand beyond the purely computer games field, but we never seemed to quite manage it. The UK games industry was completely blindsided by the consoles. You know, we'd had probably almost 10 years of very cosy, you know, Britain's very healthy, it's got this really healthy market. So eventually, by the beginning of 1991, Newsfield was really out of money. However, the original founders, along with a familiarly named Jonathan Rignall, banded together and formed a new company, Europress Impact, who took over starting with the release of Zap issue 79. And true to form, they blamed being away on Lloyd Mangrum wanting a nice long holiday. But alas, the truth was to catch up with them sooner than later. With the 8-bit market now fully working against the team, it was time for a new magazine to take the reins. And that mag was Commodore Force. Issue 91 of Zap was incorporated into its first issue. Issue 10 of Zap 64 slash Commodore Force would be Zap's 100th issue, and they included this four-page centre pullout to commemorate. But alas, issue 16 was the last mention of Zap. And that was the end of Zap 64. Or was it? Yep, the spirit of Zap lives on in fantastic magazines like Retro Gamer, which really is the modern day incarnation of everything that made Zap great. And to a literally lesser extent, Freeze 64 which even features a column by Jazz Rignall. But more than that, Zap has seen a few re-releases. In 2002, issue 107 was released in digital PDF format, designed by fans. Well, that kind of puts Splash and Crack to shame, doesn't it? But I mentioned Retro Gamer magazine, and a special 64-page issue was designed in July 2005 to commemorate Zap 64's 20th anniversary. This was Zap issue 108 and contained new content contributed by former editors. And for the first time in years, Zap was back on the shelves of WH Smiths. Even better, Zap 64 Annual 2019 was released as a 112 page hardcover book under a Kickstarter campaign created by the multi talented Chris Wilkins. It was a great opportunity to catch up on the 13 odd years of new Commodore 64 game releases. By the way, Chris also publishes the incredible Fusion Gaming magazine. Look out for an article by someone called Perifractic in their upcoming Amiga special as well. Weird. But it's funny just how things work out, you know. Zap was to come full circle for me with the 2020 Kickstarter Zap Annual. See, I was interviewed for it by John McDermott about my Lego Commodore Brix D4. And I still can't quite believe that the interview was edited by Roger Keane himself. But not only does Zap live on in the hearts of those who grew up with it, it also lives on at many fan websites. Apparently you can even find documentaries about it on something called YouTube. Mm. And yes, there will be a 2021 Zap annual, and rather foolishly, they've asked that perifractic guy to write an article for that too. Hmm, maybe it's time for a different hairstyle. I'll be back soon with more fun retro recipes, but until then, from me and Rockford, Yes, and Lady Fractic. Thanks for watching, subscribe below, and cheerio. Millions, 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 millions.
million. Million. <laughs> million. 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 Billion. Million. Million. Million! million. 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 Wait. I just want to see uh, how many times you'd say it. Oh, I would do it until we were done. That's what she said. <laughs>